We'll go ahead and get started in just a minute or two, so give everybody a chance to come in and grab a seat and be careful, no pushing and shoving on the way in. So. Last call for Sunday school, Dan. Good job. <clears throat> Tell you what, let's go ahead and, and get rolling. Um, this is lesson 19. I can't believe that we have met 19 lessons on this so far. Uh, and this week we're going to be uh, talking, uh, finishing up our discussion about original sin. And then we're going to talk about the transmission of sin or how guilt is actually imputed to us. Uh, as when we're born, no, even before then. So uh, just want to make a couple of administrative notes. Uh, if you're missing a handout uh, for any of the lessons, please let uh, Brent or I know. Both of our email addresses are in the church directory. So feel free to you know, send us an email, and we will send you the uh, handouts that you're interested in. In addition, I think uh, I'll speak on Brent's behalf here. We'll just start sending out to anybody that sends us an email address we'll just send out the handouts to that email address each week just so that people have those and can follow along uh, with our class. Also, I want to just uh, cover something from last week. Uh, I may have misspoke last week. Uh, Somebody uh, told me that I said that evil came into the world through original sin. And on the face of it, without digging down deep into that, that kind of makes sense because creation fell, man fell, everything uh, fell at Adam's fall. Uh, And that's what original sin is all about. But certainly evil in the guise of Satan, who tempted Eve, was in the world prior to original sin. So just, you know, being, trying to be technically clear, um, evil was here uh, from the fallen angels, the demons that were, that were in the earth. But um, Eve, the original sin is, is really that instrumental cause of how everything was ruined uh, at the fall. And so, you know, in in prepping for this lesson, talking about the transmission of sins and how we are sinners um, from the very beginning, uh, I needed some encouragement. And uh, Dr. Gerstner really provided it last week when he was talking about justification and sanctification in our Sunday evening uh, video. But I just want to just read Romans 8, 28 through 30, that that we all are very familiar with. And it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be more Christ-like, to reflect God, to show that image of God even more. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God is going to finish the work. Look at Philippians 1.6. If you've never memorized this one, it's a short verse, and it's, uh, it's one that is very easy to memorize. And Paul says that I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. There's great hope to be found there, that God has promised that he will finish that work. And this is a God who meets every one of his promises, a totally faithful God who's never failed. And we can take great assurance, great hope in knowing that he who began a good work in us will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. So let's open in prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for bringing us here yet one more time. We would ask, Father, that you would open our hearts and open our minds, that we would hear your word uh, today, that we would take it especially down deep into us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to enable us, and that, Lord, in all things we would glorify you. We pray especially for Eric as he preaches another difficult passage out of Scripture. 
We pray for the minds and hearts of everyone in this room today and those who may be watching it um, via Facebook. And Lord, we just ask that you would just, just bless us with your presence. Let us know you even more uh, this morning and this afternoon and throughout your day. Lord, we pray that you would keep us focused uh, through every time scripture is read, through every time we pray, every time we sing, let us look at those words and sing them with full meaning. And may you be glorified, Father, during this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so just quick review again. Once again, scripture is, is our source of truth in all things. It says it right there in your handout, so it's gotta be true if it says it in the handout. Um, we've talked about theology proper, which is the study of the being, attributes, and works of God. We've talked about the doctrine of creation, and that's the unit that we're in right now is creation and anthropology. Anthropology meaning the knowledge of man. So we're studying mankind in general and um, cre created things in total. Uh, Brent talked to us about angels and demons. He talked about angels and their roles and demons that as fallen angels and their reality. And he talked about Satan and his many roles. And then we talked how much... The creation of man, the doctrine of creation, is under constant attack today. And every attack on the creation uh, as, is an assault on the dignity of man because we were created in the image and likeness of God. And remember, that's what gives us our dignity as human beings. That makes us different from all the creatures that were created uh, by God in the creation. We were made in God's image and likeness, and that's a unique ability to mirror the image of God. And remember, Paul tells us, though, it's like looking into a mirror made of bronze, and then once you turn away from that mirror, you start to forget what you look like. Well, you know, that's, that faulty mirror is what we are. We are still the image of God. We still reflect that image in which he created us, but it is terribly marred. And sin is what mars that, and sin from the very beginning. And remember, we saw that in the Westminster Confession, or the Catechism, sin is any want of uh, conformity to or transgression of the law of God. It alienates us from God, and it estranges us from nature, from God, from others, and from ourselves. It's a total estrangement. And as, uh, as we see, reconciliation is a word that is used throughout Scripture to talk about that whole idea of coming into the new life of Christ. We're coming more and more like Christ. So sin alienates us from, from many things. Didn't cause a, Adam's sin, but he purposed it to order it for his own glory. God, remember, we know that uh, from our Sunday night studies, that God is never the author of sin. But God, being the sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God that he is, can turn that evil to good by bringing glory into himself. And that's exactly what he did with that sin of Adam. And the fall affected everything from man to the cosmos. It was a total fall. Because remember, Scripture tells us that creation is groaning, waiting for that restoration to come to restore all things. And when all things are restored... It'll be the new heavens and the new earth when Christ comes again. And original sin describes our fallen sinful condition. Remember, it is not that sin, not that eating of the fruit itself. It's the results of the eating that fruit, uh, our sinful condition, out of which actual sins occur. And then finally, we just kind of brush through it real quick, but I just want to hit it because we'll be hitting it a little bit more today, is the four states of man that Augustine uh, stated in his study in original sin. Remember, pre-fall, man was both able to sin, and we know he was able to sin because he did when Adam ate the forbidden fruit, but man also was able not to sin. And the Latin words, you know, are, are there, posse non pecare, and posse pecare simply means able to sin or able not to sin. And then after the fall, man was not able not to sin. I apologize for the double negative, but that's what Augustine used. So it's not able not to sin. So non posse, non pecare. And then uh, regenerate man is able not to sin. We still sin, but we are also able to choose not to sin because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
So that's a, the great move that came about uh, when we were regenerated, turned into new creatures. You know, the new birth starts to have more and more meaning, doesn't it, when you think about you, all creatures are fallen, but in order to know God, we have to be a new creature. And that new creature is not stained, okay, has the ability not to sin. Although some people think that we don't sin once we come to Christ, we do sin. And it's obvious, all you have to do is look at yourself, but look around us. But we're able not to sin. And then in glorification, when Christ comes again, we are, when we come to join him, we are no longer able to sin. Non posse peccare. Uh, what a wonderful thing to be is not to be able to sin. And uh, I can't wait for, for that justification. So today we're going to continue on. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Christian and our sin. So what is our sin? You know, why do we still have sin in us? Why do we still sin? Um, we know Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. Um, and I don't think he was. I think uh, he saw his sin more than most people and therefore saw how much sin had dominion over him. But um, we're also going to talk about why I am accountable for my sin, why each, of, each one of us are accountable for our sins, even though God gave us a sin nature, okay, that after the fall, that was visited upon us as a just punishment for sin. Um, why am I still guilty for it? And then finally, how is that guilt transferred to us? It's, uh, it's a fascinating study. Uh, it's really interesting. I would encourage you to read the the. Uh, discussion of it say non pecare that means not able not to sin we still sin first john 1 8 10 <clears throat> 8 through 10 says if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So that beautiful piece of good news right in the middle that says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness is bracketed by the sentence that say, if we say we don't sin, we're a liar. And there's a sin right there in itself. Okay, so it's, it's just wonderful the way God has inspired a scripture to teach us. We sin, God has cared for, taken care of that sin, but we still sin. And why do we do that? Well, all people are unable to obey God rightly and completely. So some of those things that we call, you know, little errors or mistakes are probably sin because they probably violate loving one another Okay, remember the greatest command was love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. So if we don't have the right motive when we act, we are most likely sinning because in order for something to be perfect, it has to be according to the law of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it has to be done for the love of God. So we need to be focused on that love and why we obey and why we live as we do according to God's law because it is God's word. Dr. Sproul says, for an act to be truly good, to really hit the mark of God's standard, it must correspond outwardly to what the law requires, and it also must be motivated by the love of God. So our motivation is where we often fail. That's where our problem often occurs is why we do things. A lot of times we'll do the right thing, but we do the right thing because it's best for us rather than because God has uh, told us to do the right thing. You ever thought about speeding? Okay, is speeding a sin? Well, what does the fifth commandment say? It says, honor your father and your mother, doesn't it? Okay, and what does the Westminster Confession tell us that means? It means to honor all rightful authority. So is the people that put up those signs by the road that say 55, are they rightful authority? Well, I'm going to leave that one to you. I don't, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But um, anyway, Dr. Gerstner, I love what he said about sin uh, in the video last week on justification. He said, sin remains, though it does not reign. So the power of sin in our life has been broken. Okay, but we still sin. 
Jesus says that people can't do the work of coming to God without the enabling of God. I love it in John 6, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Wonderful promise that he is coming, okay, and he will raise us up with him on that last day, but we still sin. And we can't turn away from sin without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent to us. He was not saying that no one is allowed to come to him, but he was saying we are not able to come to him. We're not able with that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's something that God has to do in our life is called effectual call or regeneration, where we become a new creature. All things have passed away. All things are new. So let's move on. The doctrine of original sin makes that effectual calling of God absolutely necessary. If we're not made a new creature, we can no longer, we cannot choose not to sin. So it is the spirit who gives life, it says in John 6. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is just such a wonderful passage. For by grace we say through faith, this not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So that doctrine of effectual call is so important of regeneration. Everything hinges upon that regeneration. Eric preaches some wonderful messages from our sermon. Everyone's wonderful. Everyone is straight from the word of God. It's an exposition of the word of God. But we would not understand those messages if we weren't indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if we weren't generated, if we weren't new creatures. It is that movement of the Spirit in our lives that makes us capable or able to understand God's Word. So many don't agree you know, and, and claim that there's an island of righteousness in every man. A couple of weeks ago, I, I gave, gave this handout. And I would encourage you to go back and take a look at it. If you don't have it, you know, just let me know an email and I'll send you a copy of it. Because that handout talks a lot about the different views between um, Augustinian uh, belief, which is what we believe in semi-Pelagian or Arminian belief. And many of our Christian brothers really believe that it was them who made the decision on their own power to come to Christ. But... Ephesians says we're dead in our sin and our trespass. We'll read that in just a second. Romans says none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, excuse me, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Romans 7, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Further in Romans 7, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and taking me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And before that in Romans 6, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness so it's a whole different thing we were made in the image of God in the fall we lost the image of God in its narrow sense we lost the original righteousness that we have but we retain the image of God in its broader sense meaning that we have the ability to reflect God's character even though it's imperfect but hopefully through that process of sanctification in which the Holy Spirit indwells us and draws us closer and closer to Christ every day, hopefully through that process we're becoming more like him and we're able to reflect God's character more and more, better and better every day.
So the perfections that were granted to us were lost, but the many other similarities, all those communicable attributes that we talked about way back in the beginning, those communicable attributes were indeed still possessed by us, but certainly imperfectly. So if God allowed me to have the sin nature, if God even visited that sin nature upon humanity as just punishment for a just sin, the doctrine of original sin raises the question, well, how can God hold us accountable for sin when we can't do anything about it? Uh, and Dr. Sproul kind of wound it up in one sentence right at the beginning. He said, we do not complain about the vicarious transfer of righteousness from Christ to us, of righteousness. It is the transfer of unrighteousness from Adam to us that gives us so many problems. We like the good news, we just don't like the bad news. And most people that, that talk about sin and, and don't believe that they sin, they have taken that good news 100% and they've ignored the bad news. And if you ignore the bad news, you're ignoring the whole reason for salvation. Let's just take a, a moment to read through once again chapter six of the fall of man of sin and of the punishment thereof that comes out of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Would somebody read paragraph one, please? Okay, notice this, their sin. Okay, God didn't make Adam and Eve sin. It was their sin, but God used it for his own glory. Okay, paragraph two, please, somebody. Remember, God said that the punishment for disobeying him is death and they immediately brought death into the world through that sin. Paragraph three. Okay, notice the guilt of this sin was imputed. It was put on their account. And it... That, uh, and it was conveyed to all posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. And why do we have that phrase, by ordinary generation? Because Christ was born of the virgin birth. That's why the virgin birth is so critical, because he was born not by ordinary generation. He was born by the uh, Holy Spirit. And so it's so important to know that Christ is so different from us even though he was fully God and he was fully man. Okay, paragraph four. They don't even hesitate a moment. All those actual transgressions immediately proceed from that fallen nature. Paragraph five. I don't think there's anything needed to be added to that one, do you? It's the corruption of our nature. Our nature has fallen. And then finally, paragraph six. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God, and contrary thereunto, doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God, the curse of the law, and so made subject to death to all men who are spiritual, temporal, and eternal. And the curse of the law is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, uh, 12 through 21 is probably one of the best passages that you're ever going to read that explains how sin came into the world and how we can be righteous before Christ because we have his righteousness imputed to us. And it really breaks down into three parts. Uh, 12 through 14 talks about how that guilt is imputed to us, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 
Uh, 15 to 17 is a discussion of the contrast between Christ and Adam. We're not going to talk very much about that one this morning. But verses 18 to 21 that we are going to talk about talks about grace. Gives us the wonderful good news. So Romans 5, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Okay, it's kind of a little difficult reasoning in this passage, but this again is, is Paul, who obviously was a genius, okay, who is trying to communicate to us that we are dead in our sin and trespass, that sin has been in the world since Adam, and uh, we are saved through Christ's righteousness. So his reasoning goes like this. Looking back to kind of Genesis 2, 16 to 17, at the fall it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you, must surely, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we see in that Adam was given a command, and he was given a sentence if he broke that command, and he broke that command. So death came into the world through Adam. The law didn't come until Moses. So from the time of Adam until Moses, there was no explicit law other than the command that was given in the garden. But sin and its consequence, death, still reigned in the world. So Paul summarizes that the only way we could be guilty of sin is if Adam's sin was imputed to each and every one of his posterity. That curse of the sin, we're going to talk about Adam as our representative, as our federal head. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But uh, what we want to see in this whole passage is that reasoning that Paul is using is logic to try and show us that sin came into the world and was in the world, and even when the law had not yet been given, uh, that sin was still there. And that that sin came all the way from Adam. And, and so it was. Let's look at Romans 5, 18 to 21. That says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The very presence of death from the fall onward, and remember that death was the curse of the law, Okay, Adam broke the law as he was given it, not to eat the forbidden fruit. And so the very presence of death shows our guilt along with Adam. In order to stand guilty before God, we don't need to duplicate that in our own life. And you'll see in a, in a moment, there are some people that actually say that, that that was just all an allegory, that Adam and Eve didn't really live. It was just a picture of what each and every person has to do in their own Christian life, they have to make that own decision whether to sin or not to sin. Well, that's kind of hogwash. Um, but we don't have to justify it. We don't have to duplicate that. We already stand guilty. How is guilt transferred? Was this kind of interesting? I kind of jumped into it. Didn't really mean to do it, but there it is. Okay, there are four positions on how Adam's guilt is transferred to us. The first one is that it was all mythology that Genesis was just a parable. And parabolically speaking, uh, the liberal theologians say there was no historical Adam and there one was no historical fall. They believe that Genesis 3 is that parable, but the fact that every human being is born good and righteous, uh, but then experiences temptation and a personal individual fall. 
every individual duplicates in his or her own life the fall. But the problem is it denies what Scripture teaches. I mean, it's a great idea. It's a great story. But there's nothing in Genesis that is parabolic, that's a parable. Genesis is a narrative. It is giving us fact of what actually happened. And Jesus even quoted from Genesis. Okay, so if Jesus is quoting from Genesis, therefore it's a pretty good source, isn't it, that he shows us. And we talked about that earlier. Uh, but the problem is it denies what Scripture teaches. Death is the result of sin. And if there was no real sin, then why does death reign? And all you have to ask yourself is, why do innocents die? Why do little ones who really, we don't believe that they have come to the point where they can make a decision to sin on their own, but why do they die? Because they are guilty. They are guilty of that sin that is imputed to us. That curse of the law is still in the world. And that curse of, is still in the world because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that, that mythical solution just doesn't hold water. It just doesn't make any sense that Genesis was a myth. Uh, the school of realism, in two different flavors, are a couple of the other ways that people say that sin came into the world. So first it's called the crass version. And it's, it's crass because uh, it says that it would only be just for God to visit us with fallen natures only if we had actually sinned. And the people that espouse this uh, theory go to Ezekiel 18, 2-4 and said, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on age. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And, you know, we can turn that around and say it says the soul that sins shall die. So therefore, anyone who experiences death has a soul that is sinful. And that sinfulness uh, came from the very beginning. But those realists, those crass realists, believe that our souls were preexistent. That if it was only just for God to visit a sin nature upon us as punishment for our sin, if it was only just if we were actually the sinners ourselves, they are trying to say that we actually really were there in the garden with Adam. That's where this idea of realism becomes. We were really there. They believe that our souls were preexistent. They believe that our souls were present in the garden. They believe that our souls somehow participated in the fall. And Melchizedek is what they use as proof of this. Um, in Hebrews 7, they say, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So if Levi, who was two generations behind garden. But I want to point out, as Dr. Sproul does in his book, the Hebrew says one might even say. Basically, it's saying, well, it could have been that we were there, okay, but it is not taught as dogma or as doctrine, but as a speculation. And we don't see that idea anywhere else in Scripture. And one of the important hermeneutics or ways that we interpret Scripture is through the phrase, Scripture interprets Scripture. So when you hit a hard part of Scripture, you look for where else that idea was taught in Scripture, and you see how Scripture will explain itself. And usually what we see a lot of times in the New Testament, we'll see the apostles or even Jesus faithfully interpreting an event that happened in the Old Testament. Do any of you remember the event in the Old Testament where there's a plague going through the camp? And God told Moses to lift up a serpent, okay, that serpent, uh, and as when that serpent was lifted up on a pole, okay, then people started to heal. Well, you know, what was that all about? Well, we don't know until Jesus tells us in the New Testament that just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. So here's this weird event back in the Old Testament that is infallibly 
translated, infallibly interpreted for us so that we could see why it happened. But, you know, this, this all depends on the fact of somehow we were in the garden when we get back to realism. But our souls did not exist in the past. That's getting dangerously close to Mormonism that believes that souls are spirit children that are put into a body here on the earth. Um, it's, it's a real stretch to, to believe in realism. And it flirts with the ideas of reincarnation. But I got to tell you, it's interesting. It's fascinating at best to see some very smart people believe this, but it's just not able to hold up under scrutiny of the scripture. The school of realism's sophisticated version was a little bit different. It agrees with the other realists that we can only be uh, justly accused or given a sin nature as punishment for sin if we committed the sin. It says that in the mind of God, you preexisted. Well, of course we did. In the mind of God... You know, God is, I am. He is past, present, and future. God knows us, knew us, and will know us. And it says that in the mind of God, we preexisted. So basically, it takes that idea and turns that idea into being. And this more sophisticated version of realism says, since we were in the mind of God at that time, we were beings, and therefore we participated along with Adam in the fall. It makes many assumptions about God and us and, and really gets down to Plato. Plato said that, you know, there were, there were two realities, uh, spirit and, and man, spirit and being. Okay, spirit was good, being was bad. And so, and he also believed that the spirit was eternal along with God. To this school of realism. However, Jonathan Edwards, a wonderful man, okay, took that view. That's how he thought that sin came into the world. But let's take the last few minutes to look at the, the final reason. We talked about mythology, we've talked about school of realism, crass version, and school of realism in a more sophisticated version. Let's look at another theory that is much more biblical that is supportable by scripture that we've even read through today. And that is called the school of federalism. Now, let me warn you, don't take federalism and confuse it with a heresy that was in our church, in our denomination about 20 years ago called federal vision. Just because they both have the word federal in, them, federal in them, don't confuse them. Federal vision was a heresy which... Uh, was rampant in the PCA around the turn of the millennia and which was found to be a false gospel. And so I don't want to go much more into that, uh, but if you want to chat about it afterwards, we can. But federalism basically said that Adam represents us. Adam was our federal head. You know, just as Jesus represents us, Adam uh, did not act alone, but when he fell all of his posterity fell, all of mankind fell because he was the representative of mankind. He was the federal head of mankind. After all, the, the name, word Adam means man. And so under the school of federalism, Adam acted as a substitute for us. So as the federal head of the human race, just as officials in, in our own federal public rep represent the people, Adam was acting as the federal head of the human race. He represented himself, and he represented all people subsequently born to him through normal generation, just like it said back in the confession. So when he fell, all whom he represented fell with him, and we can be held accountable for what he did because he represented us. Well, in the same way, we learned uh, through this passage of scripture we've already read today that Jesus represented us in his work on the cross. He is our vicarious substitute. He stood in our place. God counts us righteous because he transferred our guilt to Jesus and Jesus' righteousness was imputed to our account. We were labeled righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's a, a doctrine called double imputation, and we'll be talking about that one in a few weeks. Um, 
And that's another hard one, and I'm hopefully Brent will be covering that one. So, but uh, but if we inject, if we object in principle to representation before God, we lose our salvation, and we lose our salvation because the only way that we can be saved is through the representative work of another, and our representative in that case was Jesus Himself. And you know, I, I love this this comment that. Uh, Dr. Sproul makes, he says, no damnation without representation. You know, he's, he's using, he's saying, we, why were we damned if, if, you know, we weren't there? But our representative was there. Our federal head was there. The head of mankind was there. The first man was there through whom all progeny passed through. So we were accurately represented, and we were flawlessly represented by the representatives that God chose. God's choice of representatives, Adam and Jesus, was a righteous choice. It was a righteous choice by a perfectly holy being. It was made on the basis of his perfect knowledge. He knew that Adam reflected us perfectly. And he knew that Jesus reflected him perfectly and had perfect righteousness. We can't say to God that Adam misrepresented us. You know, that's just the basic assumption we make when we try to escape the transfer of guilt. God perfectly selected our representatives. And by the grace of God, we are saved through him calling us to be his by making us new creatures through that effectual call and through generation. And remember that he who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. So just quickly in summary, original sin is the effect of the fall. Everything is broken. The guilt of that sin is imputed to us through Adam as our federal head. Adam's guilt was transferred to all his posterity after the fall, except for Jesus. We are accountable for all our sin, original and actual. The devil made me do it. Doesn't work, folks. It it just doesn't work. So all actual transgressions come because we are sinners. And as Christians, we still sin and will until the day that we are glorified. But praise God that we will sin less and less every day as we are conformed more to the image of Jesus. So how do we put it into action? I mean, that's that's some pretty heavy teaching, isn't it? And I would encourage you to go back and and read that chapter through in the book and, and, and understand it even better. But understand that sin is alienation from God and flee from it. Just as you, you know, don't do things that you know your spouse just hates. We don't do them. Well, one reason we don't do them is because we don't want to displease our spouse. Well, you know what? One of the reasons we should flee from sin is because it displeases our God. Our sin nature comes from Adam as a result of the fall. And we add to that original sin, we add to it actual sin, sin upon sin. And then finally, here's the interesting thing. As you're talking to your friends, as you're sharing Christ with them, know that they have to understand the bad news before they see any need for the good news. So don't be embarrassed to talk to others about sin. Is it an old-fashioned notion? Yeah. It's been around since the birth of mankind. But it is real. It is well documented throughout Scripture. Know what the Scripture says about sin. The wages of sin is death. And be sure to acknowledge your own sin when you're talking to somebody else about theirs and help them understand how deep that sin is embedded in their being, in their who they are. So finally, confess your sins daily and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance to avoid it. Remind yourself if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So remind yourself over and over that someday, by the grace of God, you will be non posse pecare. You will be not able to sin. What a wonderful day that would be. Jonathan, would you close us up in prayer, brother?
Amen. Uh, Brent will be here next week wrapping up our uh, talking about the covenants, and uh, that'll.